Now, the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD, in collaboration with Star Ghana and media partners, is holding a multi-stakeholder dialogue on the free SHS and the double track system. These issues have sparked intense debates about the nature of consultations undertaken by government before its adoption of such policies. Let's cross over to the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center for the Dialogue, where Acting Managing Director of Graphic Communications Group, Ransford Tete, is speaking. For other policies, can you and your colleagues in government and the minority engage so that when we're going to roll out a major policy initiative like this, we'll have consensus, we'll build consensus, we'll agree. Because I ask myself, those who are against the policy, have they come out with alternatives? What happens to the over 124,000 students who, if the double track fails to come on stream, will not gain admission? Will you be happy if your child does not gain admission to secondary school? You know, I believe that it is because we also don't want this syndrome of past no way that people experienced in the 70s and the 80s. That is why we are where we are. So I believe that all of us will pay attention to the panelists and listen to them attentively and pray that the Minister of Education, the GES, and other stakeholders will be able to deal with the challenges that have been pointed out to them through and uh, uh, supervision and all that. So, Mr. Deputy Minister, we want to hear you and hear how you are going to deal with the issues of truancy that people are raising, how is supervision going to happen, the contact eyes, so that the dangers that people foresee can be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ransford. Um, remember, we are on the dialogue on education policy in Ghana, unpacking the double track system, implications for sustainable financing and prospects for educational quality in Ghana. We are coming to you from the Kofi Annan ICT Center at Ridge Accra, and our major sponsors are Daily Graphic, SDG, Star Ghana, UK Aid, European Union, Danida, CDD Ghana, and the media partners are Joy FM and City FM. May I call to the mic Mr. Amidu Tanku Ibrahim, the program director of Star Ghana, to give us his opening remarks. It's okay to put your hands together. Thank you very much. Um, I think when you are short like me and you are called to the podium, you assess the height of the podium first and then decide where to stand. Uh, when my brother Ransford was speaking, I could see just the top of his head. And I'm wondering what you will see if I decide to stand there. Um, but thank you very much, uh, honorable minister, panelists, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm happy this is taking place. Um, I went on trek some years back to and I stayed in the guest house at Pandai. And somebody had written very boldly on the wall that uh, after all has been said and done, more should be said and done. And I think that's, I've kept on wondering, what does that mean? You know, and when we come to a fundamental issue like education, I think after all has been said and done, more really needs to be said and done because education is fundamental to the development of this country. If we don't get it right, the repercussions take several decades to undo. And therefore, changing, reforming education. What's that? What can you see? <laughs> reforming education, getting the system right is fundamental to the development of, this, uh, of the country. But we also do know that the education sector reforms take a long time to take root and to bear fruit. And so there's a need for consensus building across the parties, and et cetera, because it would take a long time for this thing to uh, bear root. And we don't want the system that another government comes and says, oh, no, we don't want this. And then we keep on having this system of changing um, a system uh, with each new government. Having said that, I know you didn't come here to listen to me. You came here to listen to the panelists. So um, I hope we have a very constructive conversation that even after here, we'll continue with the conversations. Thank you very much. Sam. Thank you very much, Amidu. Um, don't worry. Height, height is always a state of mind. Um, so you can always, uh, once you think you're tall, you are. 
Who knows? I probably think I'm short. But he says something critical. When all has been said and done, there's more to be said and done. Be careful when you say that in the presence of a lawyer who talks for a living. Then we won't leave here. But let me call up to the microphone Dr. Franklin Odro, the director of programs of CDD, to give us his opening remarks as well. Franklin. Thank you, Ace. Um, I'm not too sure if between Tanku and I, who uh, is the tallest. But uh, good morning. Um, on behalf of, of CDD, I also want to welcome you to this event. I also want to associate myself with my previous uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Tete and Mr. Tanko, uh, regarding the subject matter. Uh, for us at CDD, we believe that uh, education service delivery is a public good. And any public good that intends to serve the public interest should also involve the public involved in the policy processes, the policy implementation, and the delivery. At the end of the day, it has to be owned by us. Uh, and therefore, we believe that this forum is one of many forums that the ministry and the states and all of us should be engaging. I think the most important question for us uh, with regards to double track system has to do with how would this service delivery assure us of quality? When it comes to access, I think we are doing very well. But how do we balance access and quality? And I think that's one of the things that we will be very much interested going forward uh, with respect to how the ministry intends to deliver this service to Ghanaians. On this note, I want to thank the minister, um, his deputy, uh, and the colleagues that we've invited here. We are going to carry this conversation beyond Accra. Because I think that Ghanaians all over should be able to engage and debate and input. Thank you very much, Ace. Hello. Thank you, Franklin. Well, my job is simply to keep introducing people. Now, I'm going to introduce a gentleman who says that, and this is very interesting, if you look at your pro uh, the profile, I don't know if you all got it. One of the things in life is that when I look for problems, when I look for problems. So there's a gentleman who looks for problems. I always look for the solutions. I want to make a difference in this world. And when I look at a challenge, I see it as a key to make a difference. A few years ago, I was in the city of Los Angeles to MC the wedding of one of my bestest friends on earth. And after the wedding, he said to me, you need to meet Dr. Yao. Dr. Yao, yes. Uh, when, you, when you stay at Butri for a while, your name gets mispronounced. So he's been called Dr. Yao so many times that even the Ghanaians called him Dr. Yao. I was introduced to a gentleman who owned and was running four schools in the Los Angeles area, but in all the deprived areas. And so I went to his office and found out that he was running for office in Ghana. When he showed me the database of delegates and the database of voters in his constituency, he hadn't won the delegates race yet. When he showed the database and showed me which votes he was going to get, I knew he would win. And he won and became MP for the Bosomtri constituency and is currently the deputy minister for education. Now, it appears to me, now I'll tell you something else about this gentleman. The rumor about him in Los Angeles that was that he had just been tapped to run for the US Congress from Los Angeles. Somehow, he decided to run for Bosomtri in Ashanti region. <laughs> and he'll tell you whether I'm lying or not. Now, <laughs> he serves on the Works and Housing Committee. He's the founder of New Designs Educational Group in California, US. He has a BA. He comes from Jachi and went to Jachi Pramso. He, he, he has a BA from KNUST an MA from University of Laverne, and a PhD from University of California. Now, so, but going back to the issue, anybody who would turn his back on running for, the, uh, for US Congress in a seat as safe as Los Angeles, and who was then mentored by the outgoing congressman, and choose to come to Ghana and be thrust with free SHS as a person looking for problems. Dr. Yao, actually, Dr. Yao, I'll say Edichum, the microphone is yours. You came looking for problems. Tell us what you're doing. Okay, yes. 
Thank you so much, Ace. I'm honored to be here. People ask me, why did you come back to Ghana? And I'm excited and I'm glad I came because, as Ace told you, my mentor, who was a former congressman and a part of South Los Angeles, after I told him to advise me and I said, I have two options. Either I go and run for the seat that you vacated or go back to Ghana. Uh, he said, um, Yao, I want to let you know that America can do without you. But maybe your country cannot do without you. So I'm glad I made a decision to come. I'm honored to be here. I'm grateful to the organizers, CDD, and a Graphic Corporation, and other entities who have come together uh, to make this day possible. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be part of this process, to be a part of a process where we are looking at how can we get 181,000 students to go to high school. And, and for whom high school will be a mirage, for whom no opportunity will be presented, if we don't come up with an innovative solution which will ensure that uh, we have the vast majority of our junior high school graduates are going to high school. I know the theme is unpacking the double track system and implication for sustainable financing and prosperous for educational quality in Ghana. There's no doubt that the uh, double track has some quality tangential benefits which includes quality. But I'll tell you this, there are a number of things that we have to do in order for Ghana to see a quality education system. And I know sometimes I'm misquoted but I've always said that we don't have an effective system in place yet. And in fact, we have a patchwork of arrangements which we kid ourselves and call a system of education. We don't. If we wait for 11 years before we know that students are doing well or not after they enter our system, that is not a quality system. 11 years because KG is two years mandatory, you have six years of primary, you have three years of junior high, and that gives you those numbers of years. Uh, you have a system that says that if you are in primary one, as a nation, we don't know how you are doing. Primary two, we really don't care to know. And when you are in primary four, it's none of our business. And when you hit primary six, move on to junior, junior high, whether your teachers taught you or they didn't teach you. That's the system that we have. In other jurisdictions where they have systems that work effectively, you have national assessments. So you know that this primary school is not doing well because when we assess their students in primary two, they were not reading at grade level. In primary three, they had the opportunity to do the intervention. And when we assess them again in primary four, we know whether they are doing well or not. We don't have that. And that is what the Ministry of Education, under the leadership of um, Honorable uh, Dr. Mato Poku Prempe, who you popularly call NAPO, we are working hard to make sure we can create a system. We are working hard to make sure we have a curriculum that responds to the 21st century needs of this nation. So I just want to say that if you want to see double track as a silver bullet for improving education in the country, you are wrong. Double track is not a silver bullet. It may be a silver lining. It may be an opportunity for us to begin to look at what else do we need to do so that we can really create a system that will enable us to compete with other nations. We all have the talk about South Korea, and I hear it often. And we talk about how we had more financial resources than them, our GDP was higher than them. People will go on and tell you more, and then when they land, then they will say, our leadership. Yes. It has something to do with our leadership, but South Koreans came here, their Asian bank came to the Ministry of Education six months ago when we were trying to get them to give us close to $1 million loan to build the Bunso campus of the Eastern University, which, by the way, has been approved. They did a presentation at the Ministry of Education, and I quickly want to tell you the story before I move into my presentation. But what they said was simple. They asked us. You guys know that uh, you guys were financially more capable than us in 1960. And we said, yes, of course. And then they showed us the graph that compared our GDP, our per capita income to theirs in 1960. And then they showed us another graph that compared us to them now. 
It was a sorrowful moment. Compared to them, we are nowhere. Then they said, do you guys know why we did better than you? Even though your first president embarked on industrialization, at the same time we also embarked on industrialization. How is it that we did better than you? We're scratching our heads in shame. They showed us a third graph. And the third graph was the comparison between Ghana and South Korea in regards to the gross tertiary enrollment ratio. That is for students, uh, uh, the youth age between 18 to 23, the percentage of that group that are in, are in some kind of tertiary institution and are acquiring tertiary education diploma or degrees. And the figure for Ghana was 17%. Actually, 16, we can give us credit for 17%, one of the highest in Africa. And then South Korea, 2016, 93.6%. So they said, this is why we are better than you. you are, we are not smarter than you, but we build systems that move the vast majority of our people into some kind of tertiary education, so we have the critical mass that transforms a nation. So you have industry that collapsed. Our industries did not collapse because we had the critical mass to lead them. So when people talk about free senior high school, I talk about economic development and how you transform your nation. If we have nothing to compare, look at South Korea. Now, how can you get to 93% gross station enrollment ratio from 17% if you do not carry the vast majority of your citizens with you through secondary education? When only 48% of your students will transition from junior high school to high school, how do you get to be uh, 90%? So we had a problem. So the fundamental basis for the NDPP manifesto that said free senior high school for all, as championed by our president, Anadu Danko Kufuado, was to really create a level playing field for the poor and the rich, for everybody to have access, not just for them not for their own private good or interest, but for the betterment of this nation, so that we can move the vast majority of our population to tertiary level with quality education outcomes, of course, implemented and enforced, so that when we get there at 40%, we can see the real transformation of this nation. Show me any nation that did not have about 35 plus to 40% gross tertiary enrollment ratio that has developed. It will be hard to find. You have to move on that tangent and make sure the vast majority of your people are moving up. I always tell people, if you think this is not true, go to the prisons and find out how many university graduates have committed crime and they are there. Look at the percentage. It will tell you something. So this is not a political game, in my opinion. Um, I tell people that when it comes to education, I'm educationist first before politician. But of course, the politics are giving me the platform, so I will not denigrate it. It's important that I know exactly how this can help us and how this can really move our nation forward. And that is why I was more than happy to leave behind 200 workers and all the things and the perks and, and the honor that comes with the fact that you are a Ghanaian immigrant and all these white guys will come and salute you in the morning because I believe this is fundamental to the transformation of this nation. So this morning, as we look at the figures, you're going to realize that we had a major opportunity because the vast majority of the youth had bought into the vision of the president. NDC started a program called the Reset for BEC. Excellent idea, a novel idea. Because senior high schools, if you fail your exams, you had an opportunity to race it as a private candidate. At the junior high school level, it wasn't there, and as a result, there were many people who felt ashamed to go back to their old schools and register and race it for the BEC. So the NDC idea that you can race just as a private candidate was an excellent one, and I applaud them for it. But because high school was not free, vast majority of people who could have taken advantage of races were not doing it. Now come free senior high school, uh, the previous year, 2017, uh, the number of students who registered and did the research was 1,000. 2017, this, uh, 2018, this year, those who took it, we had 11,000 who did the research. Then we introduced another policy that said, if you happen to go to a public school 
we want to pay you 100 percent of your BEC registration because we look at the data and we realize that in most many many over the years student, the dropout rate in junior high school three was very high and we asked ourselves why should students drop out when they get to junior high school three the answer was some of the parents could not afford to register their children to take BEC so we made it free so you have that policy of ours and the NDC's policy which was actually uh, uh, became attractive because of free senior high school, leading us to fi a record 521,000 registration on BEC as against the previous year's number of 468. So let's take a look at a few of the slides and I'll tell the story along uh, because I know I have limited time here. Do you have? Okay, just move. Okay, so, so you look at the numbers. This is actually the national enrollment trends. Uh, uh, and this is talking about the percentage of students who, I, I think I have to change my location. I, I, I'm sorry, the mics. I'll go back when it's convenient. But, but you, you look at the numbers here. This is actually the national senior high school enrollment trends. And you can see that uh, the numbers have grown in terms of those who register for the BEC from 391,000 468, and we have the 521. Well, it's not on this slide, but you can move on to. Okay, so if you look at this, is one of the issues in regards to why free senior high school. Uh, if you look at the northern uh, um, sector of the country, the northern, upper east, upper west, uh, the numbers, the numbers are here. You have a situation where when students are enrolled, an average of 11.4 percent did not show up in school when they are offered a position in a high school when they are given the opportunity to go to high school only 11.48 percent did not take that opportunity in the north so one of uh, one out of every 11 something to that effect now when you come to the south regions in the south 35 percent of students who were told that you have admission uh, to Jace Pramso Senior High School, the most famous school in the country now. <laughs> they will not show up, 35%, because of financial resources. So the argument about free senior high school, of course, was settled on December 7, 2016, when Ghanaians vote overwhelmingly for the president who campaigned vigorously on free senior high school. So I think if you compare the north and the southern numbers, everybody will understand that let's do something. The question is, how do you do it? And, and one of the issues that have come up always is the issue of access. We have that debate. Some people are saying you improve access when you build more school facilities. And others are saying, no, you can use different ways. We chose to find innovative ways of still using limited facilities to improve access. But we felt strongly that the greatest barrier to access is money. So if you have any form of fees or tuition, it doesn't matter how many facilities you built, you're still going to have an access barrier. But when you remove the cost barrier, then you also have to remove the facility barrier so that you can really get the vast majority of your people in secondary schools. So after the finance barrier or the financial barrier was removed, the numbers came, 521,000, and the question is how do you deal with them? If you look at the project, uh, the graphs, it will tell all the story. You have 521,000, 2018. These are the numbers who want to go. Let's move on, please. Yes, Kwame. Next time, bring my pointer so I can do it myself. Okay, so this is the famous 181,993. This is why we are talking about double track. Had it not been for this deficit, we would not be here. But people ask, how did we get here? Um, in order not to decongest our schools further this year, because last year we all heard about the congestion and the media, especially Joy News and others, uh, were on our back. And it's good. You put some f fire under our feet, and it was good. We were able to know that some schools were truly congested and there were challenges. So this year, uh, the minister said to us that we are not going to not be able to put more than 277,537 
in our schools unless something happens. Because you see, if you do not, if you increase the number of students who have graduated, every school's enrollment, if Prempe College graduated 1,000, you cannot put more than 1,000 at Prempe without some facility intervention. Way for Prempe College not to just only accept the thousand, but accept thousand five hundred, so you can take care of all those who will otherwise not go. So let's move on. We added thirteen thousand two hundred seats, uh, in addition to the number of students who graduated. That gave us two ninety thousand seven thirty seven. The adding of the seats came from absorption of private schools and then completion of e blocks. About thirteen of them. So we have not abandoned the e blocks we've actually been able to have a complete 13 of them, and they are going to be opened in September. So together with the two, we created 13,200 seats. But if you add it to uh, 277, out of the 521,000 work into our schools next month. So that is what gave us the deficit of 181,993. And these are the students that we had to find a way to accommodate. If we use the traditional way of doing things, we use what is called the cutoff. I'm sure some of you may have heard of the cutoff. It was a magical way of making sure that students who had passed the exam stayed at home and will not be held accountable. You passed. There's no way, you don't even know that you passed, but some students just know that their name did not appear. That's the lazy way of bring, uh, solving education issues. And that is, the, I have 290,000, and therefore, if you did not get 28 or less aggregates, you are not going. When that happens, invariably, it is the disadvantaged students, it is the poor students who are cut off. And cut off will mean cut off from opportunity for their families, for themselves, and for our nation. So we thought cutoff will not be part of the discussion, and that we're going to find a way to ensure that all those who have opportunity and those who have passed the exams, including the 181,000, can go to senior high school. Because, you see, if we have all the money, everything, we still will not be able to build within that short period of time. After when Wyke gave us their final figures, and we realized that 521,000 has registered for the BEC. So the double track system is an innovative approach to actually accommodating more students within the existing facility. There are some who say, how can you tell me that Presec had 1,000 students in their third year and the school was congested, and how can you accommodate the 1,500 students more at that school? How can you even think about that? That is the magic of the double track. And the double track is not the same as the shift as we know it in Ghana, because you have parallel tracks going at the same time. They don't cross each other. In the case of the shift system, as we know, one has to finish before another will come in. But here, you may have about two tracks that have to make use their, you use their vacation creatively to ensure that they can all go parallel and acquire the same number of hours of instruction at the school. For another group. One group get the opportunity because there may be two groups that are on vacation, and then you package it in such a way that everybody has a semester, uh, two semesters of academic work done, which translates into 162 days uh, per year. So I'll quickly run through this. I, I know the moderator is giving me an eye contact, so it, it tells me that I have to. Um, so the double track system does this thing for us. You create room. Actually, to increase enrollment, are you increase contact hours? Are you also able to de um, the increase in the number of holidays? Actually, is for teachers that we want to tell them that you have more time and you can really rejuvenate and come back to work. But when we talk about the increase in contact hours, we are saying that instead of the school day running from eight to two or eight to one fifty-five, the school day is going to be eight to four, or some schools can do seven to three with one hour break in between. So we need seven hours of instruction in the school day. And when you do that seven hours of instruction in the school day, it gives you 1,134 contact hours in a year. 
And if you use the old system, the trimester system, the three term system, you have 1,080 hours of instruction, um, hours of instruction, which means the semester system, the double track system, gives students more interface with their teachers, 1,134, uh, because the school day is longer by an hour. So that is how you get to have uh, more contact hours compared to a situation where uh, you are doing eight, eight o'clock to two o'clock. So that is the issue about the contact hours. Now, in terms of the deconjection, uh, basically this is how it works. Once you have your double track arranged in such a way that your first year students are divided into two, uh, so if you have a, a typical school, <coughs> excuse me, like a preset, and they have 300 students the past year, they will be able to enroll 3,500 under the double track. Now, the enrollment for the final year, if it's happening to be 1,000, will not be affected. You don't do anything to them. Second year is 1,000. They maintain the 1,000. But instead of bringing in 1,000 students to first year, you bring in 1,500. And then you divide that group into two, the first year group into two, of 750 each. And this is where, how the arrangement is done. Now, you look at, at the top, semester, uh, you have the third year students or the final year students going on a semester schedule. However, we've made adjustments uh, for them. So the years is almost like a trimester uh, because during the vacation, they will come early and, and all costs will be taken care of. Parents will not have to pay. So they will have about four weeks of vacation and they will come back and then prepare for the WASI. So that is how the final year students schedule will look like. But, and then you go to second year, they have eight one days, which is 16 weeks of first semester, and they will take their vacation of two months. And then they have another 16 weeks um, coursework, which is the semester, and they will have a vacation. So it's a very simple process for second year and for final year students. This is how you get your 1,134 contact hours. This is how you get your 162 days of instruction instead of 180 days of instruction under the trimester system. So the number of days, uh, uh, difference is 18 days. And that's the difference between the trimester and the semester. But the semester system has more contact hours because we made the day longer by an hour. You have divided them into two of 750 each. In a typical school, that's 3,000, and you are now bringing in 3,500 students. So the first group of students, who we call the green track, report to school alongside the second and the third year students. They report to school at the same time. Then you wait. OK, after two months, they go on vacation. After two months, they go on vacation. Just as they are going on vacation, the group that was having an advanced vacation, and note it's vacation. They are not just staying at home. It's vacation because if they don't get their vacation early on. They only have one vacation left in the year, and you cannot do that to teachers. So you see that when the second group comes in, they go 16 weeks nonstop. The first group just did two months and they took their break, half a semester. The second group joined 16 weeks, and they complete their first semester. Now let's look at what happens. Meanwhile, second year is on vacation. So you just had the Deputy Education Minister, Dr. Yao Saidu Chumde, outlining some of the measures uh, that informed government's decision to adopt this double-track policy at that dialogue. Uh, we'll be crossing over back to the Kofi Annan ICT Centre uh, when we have him. And uh, they've also gotten their vacation. It just so happened that somebody took his vacation on, uh, in advance, somebody did it after two months, others did it after 
uh, their four months. But everybody has a vacation now. The gold truck that did their uh, 16 hours nonstop then gets their vacation up front in the second semester. Meanwhile, Form 2, Form 3 will do their semester nonstop and they will enjoy their vacation. And then, as soon as the green truck does its first part again, they will, um, then the gold truck will come and they will do their 16 weeks nonstop. And then um, the first group take the vacation, then they will come and finish the year. So the, the pattern is that the, the, the green truck always go first with their, on their first vacation, uh, sorry, first part of the semester, and then they come and join the gold truck and they finish the year. So they all take the exams at the same time as the appears. So this is the arrangement. And, and if you talk about how you decongest schools, note that during the first part of the first semester, the first two months of the first semester, uh, the first group seniors will be 1,000 in a typical school of 3,000. Uh, the second group will be 1,000, the second year 2,000. And there will be one uh, group, the green track is there, 750. So instead of 3,000, you have 2,750 students at the school. Then you go to the second part of the, uh, the second part of the, uh, the first semester, where you have, let's presume that even the, uh, the third year students are there for the whole vacation. You still have 1,000 students there from two who are out, so there are zero students there, and then you have 750, 750, 1,500, and then the seniors are 1,000. That gives you 2,500 students at the school instead of 3,000. Then the second half, the second half of the second semester is even more telling because at that time, the last two months of the school year, you have 750 students on green track and 750 students on gold track. The, only, the number of students in that school at that time is only 1,500. The school is totally decongested. If they were using batches, going to dining hall in batches, it's no longer the case. So this is the element that we talk about in terms of uh, decongesting schools. And, and as I said, of course, that has very positive implication on student learning uh, when you are able to reduce class size and, and get um, your schools uh, uh, not so congested, so to speak. But as I indicated earlier, uh, we should understand that the double track system is an opportunity to grant access to so many students who otherwise stay at home. And the good news is that these students are going to schools that they will have no chance in going had it not been for double track. Why do I say that? Premper College is going to admit, let's say, 1,500 instead of 1,000. Uh, and Fancipem will do 50% more. All these high-performing schools through this innovation are going to enroll more students. And therefore, the son of Kojo Mensa from Bontefufu will now have a chance to go to Infansipan because we have improved the opportunity for more students to go there. So, so this has so many benefits. And, and that is why we felt strongly that if you have a system that will not keep children at home, if you have a system that will open up top performing schools to a lot more students, if you have a system that will decongest our schools, and you have a system that is a stopgap measure, and it will give us a breathing space to begin a major infrastructure overhaul of our schools, why don't you adopt it? So I'll speak briefly about the infrastructure development. Because people are saying, I, my friend Ace talked about 100 years. Uh, it, it won't be 100 years, and I'll tell you why it won't be 100 years, because we found another innovative way of building schools. My father, who was a cocoa farmer, started his house when I was in primary one. I had to finish the university to come and help him complete. Every year he did something small. Unfortunately, GetFan has been doing school, we have been doing school infrastructure development in this country like my father did. Because we know the amount of money that will come this year through GetFan. When we begin the construction, we don't have the money. With the e-blocks, 140 of them are lying there because no budget was set aside for those buildings. They were building just like my father did. 
When get farm revenue comes in this year, we allocate some to contractors and they keep on building. And then we are killing ourselves with fluctuations in the contract amount. Because contractors, if you don't have the money for them to continue, they'll be hanging around. When you get money, you say, okay, this is my certificate. By the way, I need fluctuations. So a building that started with a million can become three million if you take 10 years to finish. So we think that's a worse way of doing business when it comes to school construction. So we also are now bringing into being, and the president has signed off, GetFund is going to use 21st century developed countries' uh, strategy of building schools. How is that done? You just look at how much money am I going to get in 15 years from GetFund. Once you know that you expect to get, let's say, $3 billion, you take just 50% of it, as a, you securitize that, borrow against it, get the 1.5 billion, develop all your schools today, and then pay it down as the revenue comes in. And you are just using 50%. And this is how school construction is done around the world in developed countries. You don't wait for the money to come. Because if you wait annually, your students are waiting. They wait for 10 years and building will never be done. So as I speak with you, there's a process in place to secure 500 million to complete all the abandoned buildings on high school campuses that have been started by GetFund, to make sure that the buildings will be available to our students so that by next year, instead of 400 students going on double track, it may be 350 or 300. So as we build more, we remove the schools from the double track list, and then they become single track. And that is the plan. And with that plan of ensuring that schools will be built in a timely fashion, and not do it the way my father did, we are going to have the opportunity to really do a major school construction uh, program to ensure that we can truly keep our pledge of making sure that double track is just a stopgap measure and will not become a, a permanent feature of our education system. On, 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 unless, of course, who knows, future needs may make another uh, ministry or uh, another people in the Ministry of Education come back to Ghanaians and say, hey, we did this 50 years ago, it worked, now we have a major crisis, uh, can't we do it again? So I, can't, I will never say that it will never happen again, but under our watch, we have a plan. And the plan is to make this a temporary feature of our education system. Now you have the number of days are there in terms of uh, days of boarding, and uh, we also have the days of instruction, the number of contact hours, that adds up to 1,134. Let's move on. And then we have, you see that one of the critical issues, and as I talk about the quality of our education system, if you really do not do more and, and expect double track to be the thing that transform education, no. I will not stand here and make a pledge to you that once you introduce double track, the quality will go through the roof. No. There are so many things that we need to do. One of them is intervention. What happens invariably in this country, in our secondary schools, is sink, you sink or you swim. You go to school and you are not high performing, uh, you're on your own, and they will blame you. You are the victim, but they will blame you and say, you can't do well, you, don't, you can't do science. You are not high performing, you cannot do science. And they will shut them at the corner and tell them, uh, you are not smart enough, and maybe you go back home. We are introducing intervention. And I know some high achieving schools does that. We are self students when they come in, uh, you begin to know their levels in English and mathematics, you provide intervention one-on-one -on -one, uh, for them to be able to catch up with the rest of their class, and that is how you build a quality education system, education system that will produce quality outcomes. So as we roll our double track, we also bring in an intervention grant uh, where schools will have the opportunity, uh, teachers will be incentivized, be given extra pay, extra uh, uh, stipend, uh, to be able to support students who are not performing. We also are signing four NAPCO graduates to each school to focus on mathematics and English intervention. So the student who cannot write or read at grade level will get the opportunity to be supported. So these are some of the uh, interventions that we are rolling out. But one critical thing uh, that I've already said that um, double track will give us some benefit, but we have to make concerted effort to ensure that nobody becomes a headmaster in this country if they've not been trained appropriately to become headmasters. The idea that you work for 20 years, you are deputy director of education, and therefore you qualify to head a school will be a thing of the past. 
uh, my minister has directed Ghana Education Service to really put measures in place to create a management track. So after teaching for five years, if you have the leadership qualities, you will be able to go and get a master's in education administration, school leadership. And from that point on, you start a career in leadership. And that is when we can create a pipeline of 21st century education leaders who know what to do to transform our schools and not a situation where the best chemistry teacher who is well liked by the headmaster gets selected to become headmaster, has no idea of human resource management, has no idea of financial uh, reporting and how they can even see that their schools are doing financially and then they become headmasters. And by the way, when you become a headmaster, there has to be an accountability framework which says your schools must perform. And if they are not performing, it's your responsibility. And if you can't do it, you have to step aside for another person to come in. Because headmastership is just an opportunity. It's not a rank. I visited my, my, my high school. Uh, I did actually have two high schools. All of, the, all, all of us who went to six form, and you always have two schools. Some people had one. Uh, but I went to my O-level school, and uh, the headmaster who was about to retire was being vilified by the people that he's the worst performing headmaster they've ever known. And, and everybody would speak passionately, this guy has destroyed the school. And then every school that I go to, I make sure that I get my data in my pocket. I write, they are A1 to C6. A1 to C6 is something that everybody needs to know in this country. And if you go to any school, ask them, what is your A1 to C6? That is, what is the percentage of your students who are able to move up to the tertiary level? That's what Wyatt called A1 to C6. So when I went to my school, the headmaster had been able to move the school from 12% to 41% on the A1 to C6 continuum. 12% to 41%. But he didn't know that he had done that. <laughs> so this guy was sitting there and everybody said he's the worst headmaster they've ever. So when I stood up and I said, Mr. Headmaster, you are going to on retirement at the right time. You have lifted this school from 12.5 to 41% on the A1 to C6. And people thought I was crazy and said, who, that guy? And then he was giggling, he was happy. That was the first time he has even heard his data. <laughs> can, you under, can you imagine? That you have done so well, you don't know. So that guy now is on retirement, he calls me from time to time because I've made him look very good. I've gone to a number of schools where speech and prize giving day, they will give you some wonderful figures, and most of the students that they are saying have passed got E8 and can't go to university with it. One school that I went to, whose name I will not mention, they had 4% on the A1 to C6, 4%. Out of every 100 students that go to the school, only four can move on to tertiary, teacher training college or nursing or any other university course, 4%. But the headmaster has written a very nice speech to be given on the speech and prize giving day, saying that his school is doing well, 99% pass, 88% pass. So I said, Mr. Headmaster, I brought your data. You have 4% pass, your school is not doing well. I'm not going to announce it there, but you better go back and sit down and change your school. But he, he also didn't know that he had 4%. So all that I'm saying is this. We are focusing on transforming education in Ghana Double track is going to give us the opportunity to enroll more students. We are also implementing a number of quality programs to ensure that we can truly transform our country and transform our nation. And that is what we are doing at the Ministry of Education at this point. And thank you all uh, for your attention and thank you for the opportunity. As the moderator gives me time at the end, I may be able to clarify some issues that will come up from the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the fun So we just heard the Deputy Education Minister, Dr. Yao Seidu Chum. He's been outlining some very interesting uh, interventions government is making to ensure that this uh, new policy, the double track policy, when implemented, will uh, address all the problems that it's intended to address. He mentions, for example, that it is going to create uh, 1,134 instructional hours, also one, over the 162 days that it will be rolled out. I've been joined in the studio by my colleague, Kojo Yangsen. Uh, we know that when this announcement for the double track was made, you know, there were agitations. Uh, how far have we come so far, especially as we know that it's just a month to its official rollout? In terms of practical execution, we haven't made many steps. Uh, what 
is let, left to be done are, are quite big. For example, they need to recruit a certain number of teachers. Mm. They say there is a pool of uh, qualified teachers from which they can recruit. But recruitment is a, is a process. And that process, we are yet to see how far along the government is uh, in, in terms of executing that. Mm. But one thing that we've picked up from what uh, the Deputy Minister has said is that clearly they've thought about all the peripheral issues. It's not just about executing uh, the, fa the double track system, but all the peripheral issues including how to maintain quality, uh, how to actually maintain the infrastructure, mm. how to continue to build so that at a certain point we can come off double track back to single track. And uh, it appears that there is a framework, a plan, a project plan for that using uh, the GET fund, which mm. they intend to collateralize yeah. the future of the GET fund in order uh, to achieve this. So there appears to be some thinking in that direction. He, the, the, there was a, a point he made which I find very interesting. He talks about the completion of 13 of the e-blocks out of the, some 140 of them which were abandoned after the NDC went out of power. Good news? Well, actually, no, not at all. Um, the 13 is a drop in the ocean mm -hmm. and it's because we in as a country we do what he's describing as his father's method of building a house when you get a little money you go and add to it and of course the get fund gets uh, populated with cash every year so what they do is they they build according to how much they get per year but thinking into the future estimating how much you get over the next 15 years taking a loan of half the value of that amount and building all of them at once with that loan uh, is a much more progressive way of getting it done. So 13, well, it's a drop in the ocean, and clearly it didn't make any difference because we have to do double track, don't we? Right. Yeah. I, I, he mentions that they're going to use some 500 million CDs to uh, ensure that many of the abandoned uh, projects, infrastructure projects in all these schools are completed over a certain period. Yes. But as we wait to roll this out, he talks about this double track system not affecting quality mm. most important which has been the concern for many of the interest yeah. groups nagrat and all these other groups yeah. would this be an assurance for them for example that this rollout once it is implemented will not affect quality to the credit of dr uh, Osei Duchum. Duchum, he has made it sound good and it's because you know he there is a plan okay but implementation is always different from uh, planning and the reality is that First of all, we have to define quality on several levels and not leave any of them out. Okay. So there's teach the quality of teaching, uh, quality of uh, infrastructure, and you know the, the maintenance of the infrastructure, which is going to be pounded. Let's be clear: when you don't take a break in the use of your desks and your light bulbs and your, all of the uh, you know the the logistics of a school, uh, you know then th it takes a toll. Okay, so there there are going to be extra costs around those. Uh, administrative costs. These teachers uh, and administrators are not going to be going home on a vacation. So the, the reality is that um, the implementation of quality, achieving quality, it, it must happen on s several levels. And we, we are yet to see it uh, I in reality in order to judge whether or not the great plans they have will actually uh, translate into positive outcomes. You, you have been following this and I know they mentioned that they were going to employ some over 8,000 teachers to ensure that this project, when rolled out, will address all the adequacy issues. Do we know if that process has begun yet? This actually, uh, Komla, is the first thing I, I mentioned when we started the conversation, that um, 9,000 teachers actually, not eight. And um, I don't know where they are in that process. I don't know how far along that process they are. They insist that we have enough teachers from, wh from which we can recruit 9,000. Mm. However, the recruitment process itself takes time. And we are now weeks away from reopening. Uh, in fact, perhaps three weeks away from reopening. So how long is it going to take them to actually interview these teachers, see where they are best placed, uh, see which parts of the uh, country they are needed the most, which subject areas? need more teachers than others. Mm -hmm. You know, all of that process needs to be carried out. And it's not a matter of sitting at your desk and, and uh, you know, picking, plucking figures from the sky. Mm -hmm. You actually have to engage the schools, the head teachers, and get all this information. In a country where we are not notorious for keeping records, this cannot be a quickly done process. Otherwise, it will get come undone uh, further down the line. So I certainly hope that they have uh, a grip of that process.